The spotlight now shines on Dave Richard as we talk about his sleepers for the upcoming 2022 campaign. I'm Jamie Eisberg. That's Heath Cummings. And Dave, let's show the list of the guys that you're highlighting. Again, we talk about this all the time when we look at sleepers. It's about the players that you can get a little bit later. And look at that, Isaiah McKenzie, not even an ADP. He is free on draft day on CBS Sports. That's not necessarily the case, but not enough drafts have taken Mr. McKenzie, so that's why he does not have the numbers next to his name. So we start with Trevor Lawrence. We end with David Njoku. A lot of fun names in between as well. And Dave, let's start with the quarterback. So I asked Heath about this with Justin Fields. Can you trust him as a number one guy? And sort of where does he stack up to some of the guys ahead of him, the Kirk Cousins, the Derek Carrs, those type of players, even Justin Fields himself? Or is Lawrence closer to where Fields is being selected to a tongue of Iloa, Jameis Winston? What kind of group do you view Trevor Lawrence? He's behind Fields, but it, it's kind of a popularity contest. And in terms of fantasy, that means that managers are looking at what Fields can do as a rusher. And Lawrence, they don't really see that with him, but he does that. In fact, the first play of the preseason was a zone read run. He actually looked good doing it. It wouldn't surprise me if he had a few hundred rushing yards a season, maybe a couple of rushing touchdowns. But what I really think is going to push Trevor Lawrence over the top and be a sneaky good fantasy quarterback is the amount of pass attempts that he's going to have. Here's how many times Doug Peterson's offenses have thrown the ball at least 598 times in his five years in Philadelphia. Four. Four out of the five years, at least 598 pass attempts. That's what they do. And with James Robinson, kind of a question mark, and Travis Etienne, a great air back, not necessarily a great between the tackles runner, I think Trevor Lawrence is going to throw the ball 600 times. He's passed the eyeball test in the preseason. Christian Kirk has become a prominent fantasy receiver. I think Zay Jones is a big-time sleeper. I think Trevor Lawrence is another one of those quarterbacks that you can get in round 12 or 13, stash on the bench, and when someone needs a quarterback soon after the season starts, you flip them for someone that they took in round seven or eight. I, I love the round 12 or 13, and as your backup quarterback when you already have a starter, like the guy with the pedigree that Trevor Lawrence has, that's the guy you take a chance on. I don't love his ADP at round 11 ahead of Justin Fields in CBS drafts. I wouldn't take him quite that early. Yeah. And I think it's worth saying, like, he threw 602 passes last year, and there were lots of bad things around him, so that could be why, but he was also pretty terrible as a passer. He's got to make a massive leap as a passer. And if he does, he's going to pay off. And as Dave said, he will surprise as a rusher, ran for over 900 yards at Clemson, over 300 yards as a rookie. So he does have that pedigree to give you those added bonuses. He, again, not going to be Justin Fields or Trey Lance, but he's not going to be that far behind in terms of getting you some of those additional numbers. All right, let's talk about a couple of running backs that you have here, Dave. Uh, let's start with Khalil Herbert, because I think a lot of people were excited about maybe the opportunity that he could steal the job from David Montgomery when we heard that Montgomery was playing on special teams. And then we saw that Montgomery was a little bit banged up in training camp. We get to the final preseason game, and it was all David Montgomery with the starting group, 20 of 22 snaps with Justin Fields. Is Herbert more of a handcuff, or is he somebody like Jamal Williams on Heath's list that you could use potentially as a flex in a deeper format? I'd rather have him than Jamal Williams, to be honest. I think he's going to get some run with this Bears offense. He's a quicker version of David Montgomery, not necessarily as bulky, but if they're going to run zone scheme offenses uh, with the run game, I should say, then I think Khalil Herbert's got a chance to succeed. And Montgomery, the way that he runs, man, he can always miss a game or two here or there. And Khalil Herbert can step in. And we saw it last year. He got over 100 total yards against Tampa Bay and that vaunted run defense in 2021. Imagine what he could do against some of the softer defenses that he'll run against with the Bears this year if given the opportunity. Yeah, if you get David Montgomery, make sure you get Khalil Herbert but even if you don't get Montgomery Herbert somebody if you don't want to take two quarterbacks you don't want to take two tight ends man put him on your list he's going to be worth taking in that 10-11 range absolutely love Herbert as a double digit round pick and he seems to for some reason go like two rounds after the other young handcuffed running backs that we think would be really good I I actually think we're more certain today that Khalil Herbert would be a feature back if something happened to David Montgomery than we are with Alexander Madison and Dalvin Cook Potentially could be the case. Uh, I think the only thing, and this is my drawback, is how bad this bear team right. could be. And you know, not that David Montgomery from a talent standpoint is dramatically better than Khalil Herbert. So as you guys have alluded to, if Herbert steps into the role, maybe we get similar production we saw last year, you know, when he got an opportunity when Montgomery wasn't there. But this team feels like it could be a little bit worse. And so I would like to see him use him in the passing game, you know, similar to maybe like a poor man's Tony Pollard or a poor man's Kareem Hunt, just, you know, the second running back being involved in the passing game a little bit more. I just don't know if that's going to be the case. So I do think he's a good lottery ticket. I do think he's somebody to leave your draft with if he's still sitting there with a late round pick. He's just not somebody that I'm aggressively targeting. Uh, for example, I like Zamir White better. I think he's in a little bit of a better standing with the Las Vegas Raider. All right, this is a guy that we may have a little bit of a disagreement about. Now, this is Dave's guy, Isaiah McKenzie. He's very 
excited about McKenzie in his role as a slot receiver for the Bills. But Heath hates all Bills. We know that. Heath is Mr. Anti-Buffalo. So, Dave, make your case for Isaiah McKenzie, and then Heath, you can dispute why McKenzie may not be a sleeper to target. I'm kidding. You obviously uh, don't hate the Bills, but I know you're concerned about the target here. I think Heath doesn't even like chicken wings. That's how much he doesn't like the Buffalo <laughs> I love Bills chicken at this wings. point. Uh, I, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of them in a couple of days. At my expense, I should add, look, McKenzie's going to be the slot receiver for Buffalo as soon as he gets over this little hamstring injury that he has. I think it's going to be sooner than later. Last year, Cole Beasley, 82 catches as the primary slot receiver for Buffalo. The year before that, Cole Beasley, 82 catches as the primary slot receiver for Buffalo. Guess what? Isaiah McKenzie is faster than Cole Beasley, and he's running routes just as well as Cole Beasley did. And he's getting the attention from Josh Allen just like Cole Beasley did. He's been the star of practice for Buffalo, not Gabriel Davis, in training camp. So I think that there's a huge opportunity for him to see close to 120 targets in an offense that should throw well over 600 times. I know that Stephon Diggs is going to be the number one guy. I know that Gabriel Davis is going to be the number two. But here's somebody that fantasy managers can take and probably expect a PPR floor of 10 points per week and upside for some serious smash plays along the way. He's going to be at least a number three receiver this year, maybe even finish as a low-end number two receiver. You want to talk about not leaving your draft with somebody, go ahead. Do not leave your draft without Isaiah McKenzie. And because of the injury, there's a dip. You can get him in round 12+. plus. I, the math is the problem for me. And what's going to happen is one of these guys is going to get hurt, and there will be plenty of room for the rest of them. But I think what, what too often happens is people take Gabriel Davis and just give him Emmanuel Sanders' targets from last year and Gabriel Davis's targets from last year. And then they do the same thing with Cole Beasley and Isaiah McKenzie. I would expect Khalil Shakir still going to see 30, 40, 50 targets in this offense. Jamison Crowder probably sees 20 or 30 targets. I just And Cole Beasley last year was wide receiver 51 on a per-game basis. Like, McKenzie could be that. He's going to be better than he's ever been before. And if Gabriel Davis doesn't break out or if Stephon Diggs takes a step back in targets, then there's room for McKenzie. I don't really believe that Mc, Gabriel Davis can be a top 25 wide receiver. Stephon Diggs can see 160 targets. And McKenzie can be a sleeper. I, I, it, this is going to be... Cole Beasley. I mean, that's what you're hoping, right. is that he's Cole Beasley. You know, could he be better than Cole Beasley? Certainly. Right. He absolutely has that, that upside. But um, I'm, I'm curious to see when we get past today if Crowder makes the roster. Yeah. That, that will be a little bit telling because I think that Crowder will play a little bit and that could maybe lower the ceiling for what Isaiah McKenzie could be. And you've heard nothing but rave things about Gabriel Davis for those of you that drafted him. So be encouraged by that situation as well. Uh, Russell Gage, Dave. So we got a situation here that he's looking at. Uh, still not practicing with the leg injury. We know that Julio Jones has been certainly making plays, and Tom Brady's been raving about him. Chris Godwin trending in, in the direction of playing week one, and Mike Evans is back. Is there enough targets for Russell Gage to be a, a, a potential starter for fantasy managers, even a three-receiver league? No, I don't think there are right now, and that's a good thing because he's got the hamstring injury that's probably going to keep sidelining him maybe right up to week one. Maybe he doesn't even play in week one, and the Bucks don't necessarily need him in week one. But let's face facts, Julio Jones is 33 years old, Mike Evans is 29, both of them have hamstring issues, and we know that uh, Chris Godwin is coming back off the knee injury that he had last year. Gage is the, the, the church key backup for all three of those guys. So if something were to happen to one of them, Gage is going to play. And if you're playing in an offense with Tom Brady, I think you've got a chance to have some good numbers. You asked me earlier, Jamie, how long do I wait for Nico Collins and Garrett Wilson to break out? And I told you the first three weeks of the season. You're drafting Russell Gage so late past those receivers, past everybody that we've talked about so far on the sleeper list, I think, that you, you can go ahead and cut him and maybe even come back to him. Maybe you don't even draft him and you just pick him up as soon as there's an opportunity for him to play. But I'm in a lot of leagues. They've got deep benches. Gage is someone that I want to carry on my roster for as long as I possibly can. It makes sense, you know, tying yourself to a good quarterback and hopefully Gage just gets healthy, you know. So we could see a situation where people have drafted Russell Gage already if you had your draft a couple of weeks ago or within the last 10 days. And then waivers run the first time, which we know is going to happen in the next few days, and he could be dropped. So don't be surprised if you're picking him up maybe after week one and he does have the opportunity to still help you throughout the course of the season. This sleeper is my favorite one of the guys that you listed, David Njoku. After watching the final preseason game for the Browns, it was Jacoby Brissett, as we expected, not looking down the field. Now, to be fair, there was no Amari Cooper. There was no Kareem Hunt. Those guys did not play, so keep that in mind. No Nick Chubb as well. Uh, but David Njoku has an opportunity, I think, to just be fed targets, and we've seen when his target percentage has been up, his fantasy value has as well. So when are you looking to draft David Njoku? As a starter or as a second tight end that you maybe want to just see how things develop over the course of the season? 
I don't mind using him as my starter to begin the season. You just think of him as a streaming tight end. He's got the matchup against Carolina in week one. I think he's going to get a lot of targets in that game. I think he's going to get a lot of targets moving forward. It's a tough schedule. Once you get to maybe week five for Cleveland, things start to get pretty ugly for them. But he's going to be a check down guy for Jacoby Brissett, and he's already looking for him. Jamie, you mentioned that. And what's the key to finding a good fantasy tight end? You want someone who's going to finish first or second on his team in targets. We know, or at least we think we know, who's going to finish first on the Browns in targets. That's got to be Amari Cooper. I think Najoku finishes second. I think he does fairly well. I think he catches his fair share of touchdowns. He's a big body that we can see Brissett rely on. And for what it's worth, last year, three starts with the Dolphins for Brissett. Mike Kosicki had 15-plus PPR points in two of the three games. That's exactly something that you'd love to have from any tight end that you take with a late pick. Najoku's the one you should target. I loved his athleticism. I think the cost is fine. It's just Jacoby Brissett is all that worries me. You look, yeah, you look at what happened with the Colts. Like when they had Andrew Luck playing quarterback, their running back production, their wide receiver production, their tight end production, incredible. They go to Jacoby Brissett, all three positions. Now, they're not going from Andrew Luck. They're going from Baker Mayfield. So I don't think David Njoku is going to be worse than he was last year. But I do, it's hard for me to think he's going to be better. With Jacoby Brissett as a scorer. So you like Higby over Njoku. Dave likes Njoku over Higby. I, I lean toward Njoku as well. 